Welcome to Game Face Studios. I am your host, Mullen Swan Man. Today I'm bringing you guys the Josh Gibson My Player series from LA 2K12 action. I know it's a bit old. Game, the new game's coming out soon. Probably gonna be playing the show instead of this piece of trash series. But either way, Josh Gibson My Player series talks about the old school baseball players. Really gets you thinking. Gets a little bit, gives you a little bit of knowledge towards the older players. Hall of Famers, some not. Just some players who had very distinguishable careers. I did a whole series on this on my channel this past summer. And I thought I'd bring it back to lead my charge into posting MLB here on Game Face Studios. <clears throat> Today's topic is Raja Rogers Hornsby, the Cardinal great. So, let's get into him. Uh, here's a direct quote from Hornsby. And I quote, I don't like to sound egotistical. But every time I stepped up to the plate with a bat in my hands, I couldn't help but feel sorry for the pitcher, end quote. Raja was born on April 27, 1896 in Winters, Texas. When he was two years old, his father passed away, forcing the Hornsby and his five siblings and his mother to move to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he started playing semi-pro ball at the age of 15, when he dropped out of high school at that same age. In uh, 1914, his older brother got him a tryout for a semi-pro team. During, the 1914, uh, during 1914, he bounced around from three semi-pro teams, and he hit 232 with 45 errors in 113 games. That makes Starlin Castro look like an all-star gold lover. In September 1915, even though Hornsby only had one year's experience uh, playing in the minor leagues, the St. Louis Cardinals signed him. Uh, basically, the Cardinals were really suffering financially, so the team searched for minor league players that could fill roster spots for much less than professional athletes. At 19 years old, uh, he was in the major leagues. He was one of the four youngest players in the National League. In 57 at-bats, he finished with a 246 average in 1915 for the sixth-place Redbirds. You know, they really were not a good team. But he did get the opportunity, and in 1916, after injury to one of the other short, uh, shortstop candidates and a great spring training appearance by Hornsby, they gave him the starting job for opening day, and he delivered. On opening day, he got both RBI, uh, versus the Pirates in a 2-1 victory. In 1916, in his first full season, he hit 313. That's a hell of a sophomore year, I guess. First full season, sophomore year, whatever you want to call it. Either way. Uh, his production dropped in 1918 under a new manager. He also had some off-field issues, including he accidentally hit a man in his Buick. Uh, <laughs> the guy was crossing an intersection. He jumped, he kind of blurred... Uh, charged out from wherever he was going into the intersection and Raja hit him and he wanted $15,000 from him but they settled for an undisclosed amount, whatever. Um, the new manager was Jack Hendricks coached a Cleveland team in a different league the uh, following uh, the previous season but he and uh, Hornsby really didn't get along well so basically he pulled a Dwight Howard and he said that he would never play for him again and the manager was fired and this was when he was still a young rookie but he was a good player um, in 1920 he became a full-time second baseman and with that position change he played there the rest of his career his real legacy began to fully come out he won his first of seven batting titles with a 370 average 218 hits 329 total bases and 94 RBI that's incredible uh, in 1921, marked, it marked the beginning of the live ball era after the tragic death of Ray Chapman. Who, he was hit in the head uh, by a pitch, so they decided to change up all the rules so you could see the ball better and the cork was in it, and they changed the balls more frequently, which meant more home runs, much a huge advantage to hitters. Um, because of this, power numbers went up across the majors. In 1921, he took full advantage, hitting 397 with 21 home runs and leading the league in many other categories. Um, after that season, he received a three-year $18,500 deal, which would be equivalent to like $285,000 today per season. Good numbers. That was, he, made, he was the highest paid player in Major League Baseball at that point. In his first season under that new deal, he had one of the best seasons in baseball history. In the 1922 season, he became the first and only player, and no one has ever done it since, to hit 400, he hit 401, and to hit 40 home runs in the same season, he hit 42. His stat line looked like a video game. 401 average, 250 hits, which was the NL record until nine years later it was broken, and the 254 for the National League is still the record. But 141 runs, 
46 doubles, 14 triples, 42 home runs, 152 RBI, 450 total bases. Still the highest for any National League player, and 17 stolen bases. He was fast, but he really didn't want to steal too many bases for whatever reason. Um, during the season, he also broke the NL home run record, which was previously 27. Towards the end of the season, he had a 33-game hit streak. He set the National League record for hits and slugging percentage, which and I said. Uh, he also set the record and for uh, highest slugging percentage ball. for someone with over 600 at bats with a 722 with slugging. On, on top of that, he won his first of two triple crowns. The mound, if there was an MVP play. award available, he would have won it that season. More controversy middle. in the clubhouse the during 1923. He had a 384 the average, and in 1924, he hit 424, the highest average in the live ball era. This man is just... He was incredible. He was not of this world during this time period. It's the sixth highest all time, but he didn't receive the MVP because a writer stated that uh, he was an MVP on the stat sheet, but not a team player. Like, that's horseshit. But 40 years later, the Baseball Writers Association of America gave him a retroactive award, basically saying that he kind of deserved it. Um, 1925, he became a player manager of the Cardinals. He won his second Triple Crown, hitting 403 with 39 home runs and 143 ribbies. He won the MVP award that season, and he had his first of two children along with that. Uh, he, he was married three times over his life. In 1926, the Cardinals defeated the Yankees in game seven in six, in seven games to win their first undisputed World Series. That's fantastic for him. Uh, what else? Oh, he tagged out Babe Ruth on a stolen base attempt to end the World Series at second base. And after a good season for Hornsby... He hit 360 uh, due to horse racing gambling problems. He was traded to the Boston Braves in 1927. In 1928, he won his seventh batting title, hitting 387, and was traded to the Chicago Cubs after that season. He set a team record for the Cubs in 1929 with a 380 average, and also hit 39 home runs. He finished with uh, he finished 18 points behind lefty O'Doul on the Phillies, but won his second NL MVP. O'Doul kind of deserved it though. O'Doul hit 398 with 254 hits. He broke the record. 32 home runs, 122 ribbies, and 152 runs. I think that's more deserving than a guy who took the team to the World Series when they lost and he set the record for most strikeouts in a World Series with eight. Uh, pretty much, what else? During the 1930 season, Hornsby broke his ankle, only played in 42 games. He became a, manager of the, a player manager of the Cubs at the end of the season, and after a quote-unquote disappointing season, he benched himself for the rest of the 1931 season. Hitting 331, leading the league in on-base percentage for the ninth time. 1931 was his last full season. He played for the Cardinals and Browns for the final five years of his career, never playing more than 60 games. After 1937, Hornsby was released by the Browns, and he was unable to retire due to his gambling debts, so he bounced around from other teams and other leagues for about 10 years. In 1952, he returned to the majors, coaching St. Louis Browns before being fired by Bill Veck mid-season. Uh, following two seasons, he coached the he managed the Reds, was Quote unquote, was not brought back after two pretty bad seasons. He was the coach for the Cubs, a coach for the Cubs from 1958 to 1960, and he was a scout and third base coach for the inaugural 1962 Mets. In 1963, uh, Rogers Hornsby died of a heart attack at the age of 66. Basically, <laughs> Hornsby ended his career with a lifetime 358 average, second only Ty Cobb. During the 1920s, he set a decade triple crown, hitting more home runs, getting more RBI, and having a higher average than anyone in the National League. The only other three players to do so are Honus Wagner, Ted Williams, and Albert Pujols. He finished his career with a 359 home average, 358 on the road, 301 home runs, 2,930 hits, and 1,584 RBI. He was elected to the Hall of Fame in 1942 on his first ballot with a 78.1% vote. I hope you guys enjoyed. Leave a like, go check out my channel for some more, and I'll be talking to you guys later. Peace, I'm out.